Tonight's message, uh, I was excited about putting together this message, and it's really cool. And what I mean about that is the way that it all adds up in the end. So with the revelation, I hope blows you away and encourages you on another level about trusting God and what he has in store for your life. So we've been talking about King Saul and David, the anointed one to be the next king of the Israelite people. And this whole series is called Legends and Legacies. And kind of as we've been talking about these two people, consider that we have been covering the makings of a legend in King David. And as we wrap up, wrap up the life of King Saul today, we will have talked about the legacy that he lived. So let's jump right in and go to 1 Samuel 27. It says, One of these days I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with his 600 men and went over to Achish, son of Maok, the king of Gath. Would you guys close your eyes? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much again for this opportunity to be together, to be encouraged by your word. God, I pray that you will open up our hearts, open up our minds, Lord God. Help us to listen to you quickly and clearly, God, and even help us, Lord, to reflect where we need to reflect in our lives, Lord God. Encourage us tonight for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So several times during this year on our Sunday services, <laughs> uh, you may have seen this illustration here. So now don't get all... Well, I had to use this thing. Okay. Don't get all freaked out because I opened up an umbrella in the building. It's God's house. So we were protected. All right? So um, the idea behind this illustration is to gain understanding of God's grace, unmerited favor, and to take it a step further, his protection. Now, we all mess up and make mistakes sometimes, but God's grace is still protecting us, still covering us. But don't you know, sometimes we can rely on and insist on our own ways, our own understanding, and we slowly start to come out to the edge of this covering, one foot in, one foot out, and give it enough time moving in this direction, and we find ourselves outside of the grace of God. Outside of the grace of God, what does that mean? It simply means that God will allow us to experience the natural results of our mistakes. Like out here in the Pacific Northwest, and maybe like this morning, we step out of this covering and we get drenched, right? Now here's how good God is. We might have made many decisions that got us out from under his covering, but it only takes one decision to get back under his covering, the decision to return back to him. Scripture backs it up by saying, if we repent, he will restore us. If we humble ourselves, repent, turn from our wicked ways, he will hear us and heal our land. And scripture also says that he is faithful and just to forgive us from our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All it takes is humility and obedience humbling ourselves, admitting our mistakes, and choosing to return to the Father and follow Jesus. But wait, there's more. In this covering of God, it includes his anointing, God's supernatural favor on your life. You have been created for a particular purpose, and his anointing is what keeps us moving forward to accomplish that purpose, keeps us advancing and succeeding in the life, in this life, to accomplish his purpose for us. That's a twofer right there, right? It's God's Swiss Army umbrella. Yeah. God's grace and anointing in one. And what for? God's grace for our protection. God's anointing for our advancement. And our part to maximize this covering, following, clo following Jesus closely and in obedience. And if we step out, we humble ourselves, we repent, and we return to him. So that sets us up for the scripture portion we're going to unpack today. 
Again, in all this drama coming from King Saul and his relentless pursuit of David, Saul had made up his mind despite David's mercy, as we spoke about it last week when David had all the opportunity, right, the most ideal opportunity to kill and humiliate Saul, but he chose instead to humble himself. Saul's pursuit of David had gone so far that David was driven to the land of the Philistines, which is crazy if you know the story. We started off with David's story and him slaying the champion of the Philistines and even having people singing about him, about how he had killed thousands of Philistines. Which reminds me, a uh, Panda Express po- proverb here. Uh, it says, um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I'm telling you, open up one of them cookies, it's in there. <laughs> but for real though, this is how far the drama has gone. David is now hiding in the land of the Philistines, and Achish, who he went to go see, gave him a town called Ziklag. So during this time, it happens to be that the climate in this whole region is building up for there to be a great war between the Philistines and the Israelite people. 1 Samuel 28, 1, it says, At that time, the Philistines gathered their military units into one army to fight against Israel. So Achish said to David, You know, of course that you and your men must march out in the army with me. Now think about it. This is, this is the one anointed to be the king of the Israelite nation, David. And he sought refuge in the land of sworn enemies. And now he's being forced to participate in this great battle against his own people. David agrees with King Achish and uh, his demand, and it goes on in uh, verse 3, and it says, By this time Samuel had died. All Israel had mourned for him and buried him and Ramah, his city, and Saul had removed the mediums and spiritists from the land. That's going to come up here in a second. But several weeks ago, we talked about how Saul and Samuel, they had a falling out because of Saul's decision to be disobedient to God's command. I don't know if y'all remember what that command was, but God had commanded Saul to completely destroy the Amalekites. All of their men, women, children, animals, everything that they had completely wiped them out. And instead, Saul brought some Amalekites back home like it was a to-go. Brought them back home with them, some plunder, and even some livestock. Now, we consider that command, right? Destroy all the people. So Saul sparing some of the lives, right? We think, of course, that's the compassionate thing to do. But what it was, really, was Saul deciding his way over God's way. God's command was completely wipe them out. So by Saul's disobedience, he had rejected the word of God, the word of the Lord. And in result, God rejected him as king, pulled back the umbrella, the covering of Grace and anointing, protection and advancement left him to the natural consequences of his own ways and his own decisions. So we have another illustration that we often hear at Venture. It's the closed hand and the open-handed illustration. There are closed-handed issues in Scripture and there are open-handed issues in Scripture. A lot of things in Scripture where Scripture isn't quite clear, and in those moments where Scripture isn't clear, God gives us grace to handle those things open-handedly. And at the same time, there are things in Scripture that are are clearly absolute, non-negotiables, and those things we must be close-handed about. Sometimes those non-negotiables may not be considered in this day and age politically incorrect or politically correct. But as followers of Christ, believers of his word, when he speaks of non-negotiables, that's just the way that it is. That's what they are, and there's no changing it. Regarding God's command to Saul about the Amalekites, it was a non-negotiable. You must completely wipe them out. And Saul chose otherwise. And he was rejected as king and revoked of God's grace and anointing. And so here we are. The great war is about to go down between, between the united army of Philist, the Philistines. They all 
God together, and the Israelite nation. 1 Samuel 28, it says, uh, in verses 5 and 6, it says, When Saul saw the Philistine camp, he was afraid and his heart pounded. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. And we get it, right? Of course he's afraid and his heart's pounding. The great war is about to go down. But even scarier is he prayed to God for an answer, but the Lord did not answer. Proverbs 1, 28 through 31, it says, Then they will call me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but won't find me. Because they hated knowledge, didn't choose to fear the Lord, were not interested in my counsel, and rejected all my correction. They will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes. And we got to understand this. God is not punishing us. This is what we talked about at the beginning, stepping out from under his covering and we are left to the natural consequences of our decisions, our actions. And just like we talked about at the beginning, it only takes one decision to get back under his covering, the decision to return back to him. But Saul just couldn't get right. And here's what he does next. It goes on, it says, Saul then said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium so I can go and consult her. Remember, he outlawed mediums. His servants replied, there is a woman at Endor who was a medium. Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes and set out with two of his men. They came to the woman at night and Saul said, consult a spirit for me. Bring up for me the one I tell you. But the woman said to him, you surely know what Saul has done. I just want to note, this guy disguises himself. In other words, we can go so far that people don't even recognize you anymore. The woman said to him, you surely know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why are you setting a trap for me to get me killed? Then Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, no punishment will come to you from this. Who is, that, who is it that you want me to bring up for you? The woman asked. Bring up Samuel for me, he answered. And when the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. And we actually have a video of this. Sam Weed? But I swear no more cheating. I promise. I'll do anything. I'll do penance. Give me penance, but make that guy go away. No way. Ah! I've been thinking about that since Sunday. That's a good one. That's a good one. Forget about it. She was scared. Because she was a fraud, and this wasn't typical of her hustle, that someone would actually show up. But you know what's more terrifying? Living life without the covering of God's grace and anointing, his protection and advancement. So it goes on to say in this conversation that they're having, um, but the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? She said, I see a spirit form coming up out of the earth. Then Saul asked her, what does he look like? An old man is coming up, she replied. He's wearing a robe. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he knelt low with his face to the ground and paid homage. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Samuel asked Saul. I'm in serious trouble, replied Saul. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either through the prophets or in dreams. So I've called you to tell me what I should do. Samuel answered, since the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy, why are you asking me? The Lord has done exactly what he, ha- what he said through me. The Lord has torn the kingship out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. You did not obey the Lord and did not carry out his burning anger against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will also hand Israel over to the Philistines along with you. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will hand Israel's army over to the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell flat on the ground. He was terrified by Samuel's words. Note that it wasn't just Saul's fate, but he brought down other people with him. And notice that there is still no repentance, no humility, no turning back to God. And in the meanwhile, David, along with the entire Philistine army, is marching up to the battle line for this great war against the Israelite nation. Check this out. While on the way, some of the Philistine army 
they started talking about David saying, isn't this the guy that they sing about who killed thousands of us, right? So they get worried enough that they actually appeal to have him sent back home. So he goes back to the town of Ziklag uh, instead of battling against his own Israelite people. But wait, there's more. It goes on in 1 Samuel 30, and it says, David and his men arrived in Ziklag and on the, third day, on the third day, and the Amalekites had raided the Negev and attacked and burned Ziklag. They also had kidnapped the women and everyone in it from youngest to oldest. They had killed no one, but had carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men arrived at the town, they found it burned. Their wives, sons, and daughters had been kidnapped. David and the troops with him wept loudly until they had no strength left to weep. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. So David was led to the raiders' camp, and there were the Amalekites spread out over the entire area, eating, drinking, and celebrating because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. David slaughtered them from twilight until the evening of the next day. None of them escaped except 400 young men who got on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken. He also rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was missing from the youngest to the oldest, including the sons and daughters and all the plunder the Amalekites had taken. David got everything back. And as David and his men were returning to Ziklag, the rest of the Philistines were returning as well after they had defeated the Israelites. And here's what happened. David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed at Ziklag two days. And on the third day, a man with torn clothes and dust on his head came from Saul's camp. When he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David asked him, where have you come from? He replied to him, I've escaped from the Israelite camp. What was the outcome? Tell me, David asked him. The troops fled from the battle, he answered. Many of the troops have fallen and are dead. Also, Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. David asked the young man who had brought him the report, how do you know Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? He said, I happen to be on Mount Gilboa, he replied. And there was Saul leaning on his own spear. At that very moment, the chariots and the cavalry were closing in on him. And when he turned around and saw me, he called out to me. So I answered, I'm at your service. Then he begged me, stand over and kill me, for I'm mortally wounded. So I stood over and killed him. David inquired of the young man who had brought him the report, where are you from? I'm the son of a resident alien, he said. I am an Amalekite. There it is. Going back to God's command to Saul, that didn't make sense at the time. But what God had in mind was that if Saul didn't wipe out the Amalekites, it was going to come back to hurt him later in life. Just like Saul, sometimes when we hear God's command, we think uh, FOMO, like the kids say nowadays. The fear of missing out. Nothing new. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Ask Adam and Eve. And so we reason with our own ways and our own understanding. But the truth is, is God's desire is that we have life in abundance. His ways are to cover us with his grace and his anointing. What would be told of Saul's legacy if he would have just humbled himself, (coughs) repented of his disobedience, and returned to God? Again, stepping out from under his covering, and especially with the self-righteous attitude, leaning on our own ways, our own understanding, you'll succeed temporarily. And then maybe you end up like me in 2012. 32 years of life just spiraling downward quickly. And I end up experiencing a severe panic attack in the midst of my life just falling apart around me. But instead, I hope you have the experience that I had in 2013. Hearing God's voice and respond to him saying, I can't do this anymore. I'm sick and tired of my ways. I trust your plans. Your plans for me. 
I surrender. God's grace, God's anointing, save my marriage, save my home, save my life. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to pray for us. Father God, I thank you, God, for who you are. You are an almighty God, an ever-present, loving and kind God who only wants the best for his children, God, to return home, to experience life the way that you have designed and purposed for us to live life, the reason for your son dying on the cross, resurrected from the dead so that we would have life, be free, and be forever with you, God. I pray for everybody here, God, that right now they'd be worked up from the inside out to surrender, to trust you, to put their own plans and their own ways aside. To say yes to you, God, and return home with your eyes still closed. If you're ready to be obedient to God's word, his calling out to you to return back home to return back to him. Just repeat after me. Father God, I repent of my sins. I repent of relying on my own ways and on my own understanding. I surrender and I declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. dead. I receive my salvation. salvation. And I receive every blessing. blessing. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Tony to uh, come up here and lead us through communion. Hey, uh, on your table is a uh, communion emblem. I want you to go ahead and grab that and you know, Pastor Brain always says this about communion. It's not what it is. What this truly is is maybe a gluten-free wafer and a cup of juice. It's not what it is, but it's what it represents. And Pastor Chris talked about forgiveness and forgiveness of sin. You know, I, I speak often to young people, and students always come up to me and say, Pastor Brain, what is sin? What does that even mean? Sin is... Anything that separates you and I from God, at its core, it's just evil. It's just not good. And God is a good God, and he desires good things for us. So what we're going to do is, if you want to peel back that top layer, on the night Jesus was betrayed, right before he died, was murdered, he shared his last meal with his disciples. And he was explaining to them that this would be his last meal with them before he'd suffer on the cross. In Mark chapter 14, verse 22, it says this, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces to the disciples and said, Take this, for this is my body. This is the moment where we look at this wafer and it reminds us that that what Jesus was about to endure for us was so significant, so painful, yet he did it for you, that on that day he thought of you thought of everyone you love, thought of everyone you know, but he thought of you. Let's take that bread together. If you continue to read in Mark chapter 14, verse 23, it says, and he took the cup of wine and gave it and thanks God and, and thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many, and I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in in new in the kingdom of God. It was in that moment 
right before they took the wine, Jesus knew Judas would betray him. He knew Peter would deny him three times. Jesus would know that you and I would find moments in our life where we know we, we should go to him. We know we should pray. We know, we know. Yet sometimes we just, we don't, if we could just be really honest. It was still in that moment that Jesus said, I'll take all your pain. I'll take all your wrongdoing. I'll take everything that you've done in private, in public, things no one's even known or seen. I'll take it all on the cross so that you could be right with me, that you could be right with the Father. And that word that Pastor Chris said was salvation. That word salvation means life forever with God. And that's what this represents. Let's partake in this together. I just want to say um, I, I'm really thankful for this gathering of people. I'm really thankful for the community we have in this region, in this building. And uh, it was fun tonight to drive here and not be able to find a parking spot. That's a good problem to have. And uh, I would just say this. If, this. if this environment, if this gathering really encourages you, continue to bring friends and family. And if you can just continue to support Pastor Chris. You know, he, I'm a pastor, and I can't say these kind of things, but I'll say it anyway. So this, this job is it's the best job on the planet, but, man, does it take a lot out of you. It takes a lot of time and, and emotion, but it's worth it because you get to see people's lives just get touched by Jesus. It's worth every moment. So pray for him, be with him, support him, buy him a coffee. Uh, but, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you guys. Have a great evening.